Okay, good evening, everyone. Good evening. My name is Catherine Carney Feldman. I'm a member of the Ipswich Conservation Commission. And beha on behalf of the Ipswich Conservation Commission, I want to invite you and welcome you to this wonderful opportunity. We have entertainment, we have educational programs throughout the year, and we are very fortunate tonight to have someone that who is truly passionate about the subject that he loves so much. He's one of the few people that I know that they can eat their passion. And this is Russ Cohen. He's going to be talking tonight on edible plants and mushrooms of the North Shore. It's a 90-minute slide presentation. And I'm sure he'll be happy to take your questions throughout. And then if any of you have questions after the hour and a half presentation, please feel free to stay around a little. And you can ask some questions after as well. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you all to Russ Cohen. Can you hear me OK like this? OK. And you guys in the booth can hear me OK if I hold the mushroom like, OK, the <laughs> microphone like this. Looks like a mushroom. So anyway. So, uh, all right, so uh, where am I from? I'm actually not from the North Shore. I'm from Arlington, Mass. I grew up in Weston, Mass. And when I was a sophomore in high school, I took a mini course called Edible Botany. And I got so excited about this topic that I taught myself over 70 more species than I learned in the class. And by senior year in high school, I was teaching that same class I had taken as a sophomore. And that was 40 years ago. And I do about 40 programs like this all over New England, upstate New York from May to October, mostly outdoor walks where I'm connecting people directly to via their taste buds to the outdoors. But So we're going to have a virtual foraging expedition inside tonight. But uh, hopefully a lot of these plants will be familiar to you, perhaps things that are actually in your own backyard. Uh, I'm going to guess that um, several species that are covered in the show you won't know were edible. And um, so that will be a pleasant surprise to you. So. This is not uh, what I do for a living. I actually work for the Mass Fish and Game Department in the Division of Ecological Restoration. And I work on rivers, so occasionally I work on the Ipswich River, the tributaries of the Ipswich River, or other rivers across the state. It's basically a desk job in downtown Boston, but occasionally uh, I get out in the field from time to time. And before, after my official work is done, I've got a foraging basket just collecting whatever happens to be in season. Because for me, foraging is a great way to enrich all the time I spend outdoors whether it's a park in downtown Boston near where my office is, or out here in the beautiful North Shore, or um, in the mountains, or uh, you know, just in the, in the suburbs west of Boston. There's edible wild plants all over the place. So it's really fun to know this stuff, even if you're not actively hunting and gathering, just to see this stuff as you're walking along the trail. It's like having old friends come and greet you as you walk along. So that's why I do it. Uh, in case you're wondering, I actually have a relatively conventional diet, is I go to supermarkets markets and restaurants and I also uh, go to farm stands and farmers markets and I grow a lot of fruits and vegetables at home but in addition to all that I'm nibbling on at least uh, 30, 40, 50 species of wild plants and mushrooms too but it's a fun complement to conventional diet rather than a substitute for it. So before I get into the show I just want to cover a couple foraging ground rules and then we'll get into specific plants and the plants in the show are organized chronologically. So the show starts in the spring and then goes through the summer into the fall into the time we're, we're at now and then a little bit past there. So. Um, uh, I uh, try to be very conservation-minded when I'm a forager, and I encourage any of you that uh, uh, do it or are thinking of doing it to uh, do that as well, especially when native species are involved, because these are plants that often have important roles in the ecosystem. Animals rely upon them for some portion of their life cycle for food, obviously, or something else. And so uh, if you pick too much, you could upset the ecological balance, and that wouldn't, wouldn't be good. So I always try to make sure there's a lot of whatever I want to pick before I start picking, and a lot left over after I'm done. It's a way of making sure the plants are able to continue to thrive in the location where I'm finding them. But bear in mind that depending upon the part of the plant you're harvesting, there are going to be different impacts. For example, berry picking along with mushroom hunting and nut gathering. Those are relatively benign foraging activities because all you're doing is picking the seed or the spore dispersal portion of the organism. And there's often a lot of those around. If you gather some, it's not that big deal at all. But if you are digging plants up to harvest them or stripping all the flowers or the leaves off plants to harvest them, you can imagine that could be a lot more traumatic for the plant and the patch of the plants where they're growing. So bear that in mind. All right, two other conservation issues. Could you pick 
uh, a rare and endangered plant species, a listed species by mistake, and what impact you're having on wildlife by foraging. Well, I have looked at the mass state protected species list. This is a rare and endangered and threatened species, and I'm happy to tell you there's relatively few species on that list that are edible, and they tend to be uncommon cousins of common edible wild plants, and the uncommon cousins are restricted to pristine or unusual habitats. So what could that be? That could be a bog or a fen or a cliff or a mountaintop, or here in Essex County, you have the coastline that's considered an unusual habitat. So my advice is that if you are in a pristine or unusual habitat and you see a plant that looks somewhat like a plant that you learned from this from this uh, show or read about in a book, but it's not exactly the same, my advice would be don't pick it, just to make sure you're not going to pick the rare cousin by mistake. In actuality, though, it's much more likely that a plant you want to pick and eat is on another state list, and that's the invasive species list. So, so here's a book. Here's a book that uh, my agency helped to put out. Uh, a little while ago, and it is intended to educate people about invasive plants. And invasive plants are non-native species that uh, don't behave properly, and they uh, take, they usurp the habitat from the native species. That's the main bad thing they do. And so, this book covers 66 of what are considered to be the most ecologically disruptive non-native plant species in Massachusetts. So ecologically, the plants in this book are really bad news. But if there is a silver lining to the invasive cloud, at least for some of these species, it might be the fact that some of them are edible. In fact, out of the 66 species in this book, at least 20 of them are edible. And as far as at least most ecologists are concerned, they'd be thrilled if we picked and ate as many of these as we possibly could. I'm totally serious about this. This is guilt-free foraging. You can't pick too much of them, provided you're not spreading them around in the process, but that's easily avoidable. So I want to give you a chance to nibble on an invasive species right away. This is a plant that's in season right now, and as we speak, I'm preparing a batch of the fruit leather I'm about to feed you. So this is a wild plant called autumn olive, which uh, grows in Ipswich, and actually the closer you get to I-95, the more readily you're going to see it, because the Mass Highway Department planted thousands of these plants before they knew it was invasive to their regret, which they'll readily admit. So anyway, what I do with this fruit is I puree it and dehydrate it, and I make a fruit leather from it, and I actually have a batch on my dehydrated home right now drying out. But anyway, so you get a batch I already made. Okay, so it's just in this little container right here, so it just passes this around. You can all try it. And when we get to the plant in the show, I'll tell you how I made the fruit leather and stuff. Okay, so while that's going around, let me address that third conservation issue, which is what impact you're having on wildlife by foraging. Well, first of all, if you're being good conservationists and you're leaving plenty of stuff behind after you pick of the native species, then you're leaving plenty behind for the animals too. But if it's any further comfort to those of you that are concerned about uh, impacts here, it might help you to know there isn't a 100% overlap between what people can eat and what animals can eat because our taste buds and digestive systems are different. So, for example, poison ivy. A lot of bird species eat poison ivy berries, deer browse and poison ivy leaves. And, uh, and, the, and the point is we're not fighting them over the poison ivy. They can have all the poison ivy they want. In fact, we wish they'd eat more poison ivy. So there's stuff that they're eating that we're not competing with them at all. But then I'll be doing a program like this, and someone in the group will stick up their hand and say, hey, I was in my yard the other day, and I saw a mushroom with an animal bite, bite taken out of it. That means I can eat it, right? And the answer is no, at least not necessarily, because as I said, number one, there isn't 100% overlap between what people can eat and what animals can eat. And number two, you don't know what happened to that animal after it took that bite out of that mushroom. It might have died a horrible death. So animals can make mistakes too, so you can't count on them. All right, so rather than go on and on about, you know, giving you general foraging advice, I want to plunge into the show here to make sure I can get through it all in my allotted time. All right, so, yep. All right, so uh, as, as Catherine goes over to man the controls for me, uh, then we'll go on to the first slide, and I'll start talking to you about that plant. And this is an interactive uh, program, so I'm going to ask you, what is this plant? Fiddlehead. Fiddlehead. Okay, but... What species is it? I think I heard somebody say. Ostrich. Ostrich fern. Very good. Okay, hit the button again. All right. Now, this is kind of important because 
picking the wrong fern is probably one of the biggest mistakes that novice foragers make here in eastern Massachusetts. And the story usually goes something like this, as you're walking in the woods in the spring, and you see a bunch of ferns at the little curled up fiddlehead stage, and you say, oh, fiddleheads, it must be the same thing I've seen for sale in the stores. I'll pick it, and you bring it home, and you cook it up, and you take a bite, and it tastes horrible, and you say, oh, where did we go wrong? Well, where you went wrong is you harvested the wrong species of fern. So I only know of two species of fern that taste good, and only one that's safe to eat in quantity, and that's this one, the ostrich fern. I don't know um, of a patch in Ipswich, but I do know of patches in Essex County, and they're up near the Merrimack River. So can you hit the next slide? So that's the kind of habitat I typically see ostrich ferns in the alluvial floodplain soil in the bottom land where it's wooded, uh, hardwood woods like uh, silver maples and stuff like that. And the fiddleheads would be growing there. Now can you go back a slide? Great. So uh, this is the edible stage. And the way to distinguish the ostrich fern from other species of fern, first, it's the habitat. Secondly, you'll notice that the, the little clump of fiddleheads is in a bit of a vase shape. And you'll see that even more when they uh, get bigger. Also, that if you see, there's a little U-shaped trough or gouge that runs down the entire stem. And also, on the outside of the curled up parts, there are these brown papery scales that flake off really easily with your fingers. So it's not like a wool, like a cinnamon fern. Okay, and next slide, and next slide. And then the last thing to look for are those fertile fronds, the spore-bearing fronds that are, uh, uh, you will find those at the fiddlehead stage too. You see what I mean about the vase-shaped clump? It really shows up better when the, the fronds are mature. So uh, now can you go back two slides? I'm not going to work you so hard in the rest of the show, but in the beginning for this one. So. All right, I just want to underscore the conservation point I made just using the fiddleheads as an example. So this is a native species, and it could be harmed if it got overcollected. And so I encourage people to just pick one or two of the little cold up parts per clump. That's it. Let the rest grow out. Because if you picked every single one, and then a few grew back, and somebody followed you into the woods a week and a half later, and they picked every single one, that could sap a lot of strength from the rhizome, and you could eventually kill the fern. So better that you just take one or two. That's a sustainable level of harvest. And usually the fiddleheads, the ostrich fern fiddleheads, are in a large enough patch that even if you're just taking one or two per clump, you'll still have enough to uh, eat. Okay, now, um, there may be somebody in the audience here said, well, I've eaten the ostrich fern. I bought it at the store, and I cooked it up, and I didn't think it was that good. And I would agree with you that the ones you buy at the store aren't that good because often they've been shipped in from Quebec. They've been sitting in the, you know, going back and forth from the walk-in cooler in the in the supermarket for weeks, and the flavor deteriorates. So there is a way though to get ostrich ferns at their best. So can you go on, go on the slide, and another one, and another one. Okay, and that is to think of it as sweet corn and cook it as soon as possible after you pick it. So here's a great example of that. This is somebody else's foraging program I went to this spring uh, where, um, uh, oh, go back, go back. Okay, Beth Basler was running this and she took a cook stove to the fiddlehead patch and basically we were eating the fiddleheads 10 minutes after we picked them and the flavor is really good. So, uh, so if you, you know, minimize the amount of time from picking the fiddleheads to cooking them, I think you'll, you'll see them at their best. Okay, next slide. All right, what's this plant? Time's up, hit the button. Stinging nettle. So this is a plant that you could recognize in the dark. This is a plant that you could recognize even if you're blind because of the sting. And if you haven't been stung by stinging nettle, it's not like poison ivy where you find out a day or two later you got into it. If you get stung by stinging nettle, you know right away. But the good thing is the sting rarely lasts more than an hour. And the, uh, this, is a, this is a plant I gather every year, and this is the first week of April usually when it's at this stage. So I'm harvesting it when it's quite small, only about six inches uh, tall. And I just snip off the top cluster of each plant. And then, next slide. And then I uh, just steam those. And um, notice I've got the tongs there because I'm not touching them. Because even as you're, as you're preparing them, if you just touch them with your bare hands, you would get stung. So I'm using the tongs to fling them into the cooking pot. And then I steam them for about five minutes. Next slide. So that's what they look like after they've been cooked. And the, the steaming completely disarms the plant. And it converts the sting into a protein. So it makes the plants about 7% protein. Uh, so after you've steamed the nettle greens, you can use them in different dishes like, next slide. Cream of stinging nettle soup, so that's, that uh, recipe's in my book. Next slide. 
and the stinging nettle balls, which is just the spinach ball recipe where you're using Pepperidge Farm stuffing mix to hold them together. And you can just substitute the steamed nettle greens. It works really well in that recipe. Next slide. Anybody know what this plan is? Time's up. So this is, cl click for me, Catherine. Catnip. So catnip does grow wild. And... Um, it has the opposite effect on people that it has on cats. It is a tranquilizer. It's a sedative. So people will make catnip tea to relax after a stressful day. And you can use the leaves fresh or dried either way. Next slide. OK, here is the antidote to the stinging, stinging nettle, the curl dock. So all you do is take those leaves and just scrunch it up and take that juice that you get and put it on the place where you were stung by the stinging nettle. It helps make the sting go away. There's another the yellow flowers. Jewelweed? Yeah, yeah. Uh, jewelweed's more well known as an antidote to poison ivy, but uh, yeah, it would work for any skin irritation. Okay, very good. So anyway, this one's edible. Uh, in the spring or in the fall, use the young leaves. This is a cousin of the French sorrel, so you can make a sorrel sauce from it, a sorrel soup from it. I blanch the leaves for 20 seconds, drop them into rapidly boiling water for 20 seconds just to take off any tinge of bitterness. And then you can use them like spinach, so they're really good in the spanakopita, the, the Greek spinach pie with the phyllo dough or the feta cheese, as is the steamed nettle greens. Next slide. All right, what's this plant? Okay, yes. Now, I've been, I've been giving this show for 40 years, and when I, start, when, when I started giving slideshows, a lot of times people would not know what this plant was, so they'd say, that's Mexican bamboo, right? Well, actually, it does look bamboo-like, especially when you see that dried stalk from the previous year's growth, which is very bamboo-like. But this plant is a completely different branch of the plant world. It's actually related to rhubarb, and it tastes like rhubarb. But, so hit the button for the name. Japanese knotweed. So this plant is at or near the top of the botanical blacklist. The ecologists really, really hate this one because uh, it, uh, uh, once it gets established in a spot, it forms this monoculture and it excludes pretty much anything. And it's very hard to remove once it's established. So uh, it's uh, bad news. Um, especially where it's pushing it to natural habitats, where it's growing next to the dumpster by the auto body shop. I'm not sure how much harm it's doing. By the way, that's not a good spot to collect it. You know, you'd want to look for a pristine spot to get it. But the plant is ubiquitous. It grows all over the place. So it would not be hard to find a spot where you feel like that you're not, uh, it's not very polluted. Cuspidatum? Yeah, I actually don't know. I think it's the shape of the leaf, if I had to guess. Yeah. But anyway. Um, it usually grows in very disturbed soils, and I was, I'm afraid to collect it because right. I was thinking that perhaps you know, toxins are going to get concentrated or whatever. You right. Know, so, 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 yes. So, uh, uh, the plant can grow in disturbed soils, but it can also just grow because somebody in, you know, leveling off a backyard for somebody had a little bit of the rhizome in the soil that was brought in. And so it's just growing in a backyard, and if those people aren't using lawn chemicals, then that would be fine. Yes? There's one way to control it. It's by repeatedly cutting it down. Just it comes up, cut it back. Cut it back. Cut it back. Right. So that it, it does not get the energy to provide for the woods. Yes. Well, um, um, we could, well, I appreciate that comment, Erica, but um, uh, let's talk about eating it because that's what I'm really here to tell you about and not controlling it. So, and I don't, I don't claim that, that harvesting it to eat it is an effective control method. It's just my attitude about invasives are if the ecologists eradicate them, fine, but in the meantime, if they're round and they're yummy, I'm going to eat them and I'm going to tell everybody else about eating them because might as well make some use of them while they're here. So... I promise I'll cover that. Okay. So anyway, when the shoots first come up in the spring and you're seeing these shoots with these red speckles on them coming up in mid-April uh, and, um, uh, and they'll be in the midst of all the dried bamboo-like stalks from the previous year's growth. So you could just snap them off at ground level. You don't even need a knife to cut them off. And just uh, you can take a foot tall a uh, little shoot and steam it for a few minutes and eat it hot or cold like asparagus. So that's one edible stage. Next slide. But my favorite edible stage is what I call the wild rhubarb stage when they get a little taller, like a foot and a half to two feet tall, and uh, I just cut them at ground level. I lop off the top cluster leaves and I have a length of stalk about this long. 
Now the very outer layer of a knotweed stalk is stringy, so I trim off just the very outer layer. But these knotweed stalks are hollow, so you don't want to trim too deeply or all you've left is the hole. You just want to get the very outer layer off. And then you have a crisp green tube like this right here, which is tart and juicy. You can eat it right on the spot. It's kind of like a Granny Smith apple. Or you can chop it up and use it instead of rhubarb in virtually any recipe calling for rhubarb. So next slide. So here is the strawberry knotweed pie that I make every year and virtually everybody I feed this to prefer it over strawberry rhubarb pie. It's really yummy. And this recipe is in my book. So now you might be looking at this pie and say, oh man, that's a latticework top. I don't know if I can pull that off. So I am going to show you a way that you can use knotweed that requires no cooking skill whatsoever. Next slide. So you could just take those little stems and fill them up with like a flavored cream cheese or a salmon mousse and you have a little edible tart cup that the, that you're, uh, and they're very, they're very good that way. Next slide. Okay, so here's garlic mustard, another hated uh, invasive species. It tastes like garlic flavored mustard. It's actually, it's in the mustard family, so it's related to cabbage, kale, broccoli, kohlrabi, Brussels sprouts, and so on. So, um... Um, and a lot of times people will try to control this plant by yanking it out. And uh, so next slide. So my favorite part to eat on the plant are the stems when the plants are about nine inches tall. So uh, if you're yanking it out to control it, take all the rest of the plant, the roots and flower buds, anything else, and that goes into the black plastic bag and off to the landfill. Don't try to compost it because it's too likely it'll survive the composting process. And then the little tender stem is the best part. You can eat it raw or you could uh, cook it in a stir fry. Next slide. The roots, uh, taste well. well, I think they're quite pungent. And so I don't consider them to be edible raw. They're just way too bitter. Now, if you boil them at, for... Right. Yes. Right. No, uh, that's fine. You know, everybody has their own threshold for bitterness and some people a little bitter. It's like, yuck, forget it. And other people, it's like, bring it on. I don't mind it at all. So yeah, for those people, and it's the same thing with this one, the wintercress, which is a cousin of the garlic mustard. So this one is very close relative of broccoli rob, but this is a wild plant, very common farm weed. I've seen places in Essex County where there are, are hundreds of these plants. And so uh, uh, the part that I like to gather those little broccoli florets on there, and you have to boil them for several mil minutes, not because there's anything poisonous about them, but just to tone down the level of the bitterness. And then it tastes exactly like broccoli, Rob. Next slide. Okay, anybody know what this plant is? Wood flux. Okay, well, I heard a couple close guesses, but no, this is actually push the button again for me. So this is Dame's Rocket, and this is another wild mustard. And um, the way to tell this plant apart from Phlox is that all Phlox family flowers have five petals. This only has four petals. This is actually another wild member of the mustard family. And this is in that invasive species book, as is, if I forgot to say, the Japanese knotweed and the um, uh, garlic mustard. So uh, these are plants that, you know, uh, uh, you may uh, pick uh, completely uh, with abandon without holding back whatsoever. So now you see how this comes in a white and a purple color and that's invariably how you see it in the wild, the two colors together. Next slide. But I tend to just eat the purple flowers because purple is a funner color than white, but the flavor is the same. And these flowers have, you can eat them raw, they have a sweet radishy flavor. Very nice, and I'll just eat them plain uh, or put them into salads or just use it to decorate other food. Next slide. Okay, so this is the slide about dandelions. Dandelions are probably responsible for turning more people off of eating wild plants than anything else. And the story usually goes like this, is that in the spring you look out in your backyard, you see all these dandelion flowers, and you say, I heard dandelions are edible. I should try them. So you go out to your yard, you pick a few leaves, you bring them indoors, put a little oil and vinegar on them, you take a bite, it's incredibly bitter. You spit it out and you say, yuck, I'm never going to eat a wild plant again, which is a real shame because dandelions are great if you eat the right part at the right time. So what what is that and when is that? Well, it's not when you start seeing whole fields turning yellow from the dandelion flowers. They're really, the plants are really too bitter then to be enjoyable. So I like to harvest the plant before the flowers bloom. Next slide. And the part that I'm going for are the flower buds before the flowers open. That I consider to be the best part of the plant. And I just pick those off and 
uh, uh, wash them off and then get a pot of water boiling in the stove and cook the dandelion buds for 60 seconds. That's it. And then they're done. And then uh, you can add them into soups, omelets, casseroles, stuff like that. But before you do anything with them, before you even put any butter or salt on them, just try them plain and you'll be amazed at how good they are. They're one of my favorite vegetables, period, cultivated or wild. They're like a cross between spinach, corn, Brussels sprouts, and artichokes. They're really yummy. So uh, if you want to eat dandelion leaves, this is the time to gather them. So if I'm seeing some nice tender dandelion leaves along with the buds, I just gather them and prepare them the same way. Next slide. Violet flowers are edible. Violet leaves are edible. When the flowers are out, after the flowers go away, the, flower, the leaves get too tough and too bitter. Other than that, they're fine. And you can, next slide. And you can candy the violet flowers and use them for decorations. Next slide. Uh, chicory is edible. Uh, the flowers are edible. They have almost no flavor, but blue is an unusual food color, so it's fun to just snip the petals off and add them to a salad. And then the leaves are edible in the spring or in the fall, not in the summer because they get too bitter from the intensity of the sunlight. And then the roots you use to make the coffee substituted additive, and the process is explained in my book. Uh, and the drink that you make from the roots does taste amazingly like coffee. It does not have caffeine in it, though. So if, if you're one of these people who said, well, what's the point of drinking it? If there's no caffeine in it, then chicory's just not going to cut it for you. Next slide. Chickweed's edible. I use the uh, uh, young plants as a substitute for sprouts in a sandwich or for lettuce in a salad. And, uh, and it's a spring or fall edible, so now this time of year is a good time to get it, as was this spring. Next slide. Daisies are edible, uh, although it's the leaves before the flowers come out that are the tastiest part of the plant, but it's a little harder to recognize then. So I put this slide up first just to you know, show you something that you do are familiar with. Next slide. But this is what to look for for the best edible stage of the plant before the flowers come out. And if you look at the buds, they're kind of distinctive. They have this sort of spokes, like a bicycle wheel pattern on the top of it, and it's a, it's a flat-topped bud. So look for that, then look at those leaves attached to those plants. And the leaves are very yummy. They're sweet uh, and um, make an excellent salad ingredient. I've never bothered to cook them because they're so good raw. Next slide. Sheep sorrel's edible. Uh, places that have acid soil, this plant will show up. And this is a diminutive cousin of the French garden sorrel, so you can use it the same way. So you can make a sorrel sauce from it, a sorrel soup from it, and so on. Next slide. This is a completely unrelated plant with the same flavor called wood sorrel. And uh, the way to tell this plant apart from clovers, you see that this plant has uh, heart-shaped leaflets. Clover has oval-shaped leaflets. So that's one way to tell apart. And just looking at the flowers, you could tell it apart. Now these things right here are the seed capsules, and they're juicy and succulent, and you can eat those too. Now the chemical responsible for the sour flavor in this wood sorrel and in the sheep sorrel is a chemical called oxalic acid, which is not good to eat in huge amounts. Like if you ate a big salad bowl full of just this plant, it could inhibit your body's ability to uptake calcium, and it could irritate your stomach lining, but there's no reason to be unduly concerned about the chemical because it's present in a lot of veg conventional vegetables like beets and spinach and rhubarb. So as long as you eat it in moderation, it's perfectly fine. Next slide. All right, so when I make uh, stuff from wild ingredients, I'm not a purist about it. Not every single ingredient has to be wild. So like when I make a strawberry knotweed pie, I don't have to use yak butter for the shortening. I could use regular butter, regular, sh regular sugar is fine, but the knotweed makes it a wild pie. So, But you can make a salad completely from wild ingredients. So can you click? Okay, so that's what this is right here. But I don't mean by you know, going to this extreme to deter you in any way from just like th throwing a few violet flowers into regular salad. Perfectly fine. But you can make a yummy salad just from wild ingredients. And uh, so what's in this thing? So the little blue purpley flecks, those are chicory flowers. The yellow flowers are wild mustard flowers. Then the green has sheep sorrel and wood sorrel and lamb's quarters and chickweed and stuff like that uh, bulking it up. And then the red berries are partridge berries, and then the orange berries are ground cherries or husk tomatoes. Next slide. So there's the partridge berry. It has each berry, by the way, has two little belly buttons on there instead of one like a blueberry because each berry is formed by two flowers that are fused at the base. So for every two flowers, you get one fruit. So that's one way to recognize it. Partridge berries have almost no flavor. So why use them? Because they're pretty. So I'll just put a few on top of a salad just to get you know some visual interest. Next slide. So there's the ground cherry. This is a wild 
cousin of a tomato, and the fruit tastes like a sweet cherry tomato, and it grows inside a husk. The technical botanical term for that is a calyx. And so you see right down here that the uh, fruit is in there ripening, and so that outer husk part will start out green and then turn yellow and then turn sort of a tan color and then eventually fall off the plant, and the ripe fruit will continue to ripen underneath the plant. So this slide's a little bit out of sequence. It's actually this time of year to look for the ground cherries. And when I see the plants and they have this soft eggplant-like foliage, the first thing I do is check underneath the plants and look for the ripe fruit, which is still enclosed in the husk. So this plant has a poisonous look-alike with little yellow tomato-like fruit that, that, by the way, it's on a plant with thorns. This plant doesn't have thorns. And to see this fruit, you have to peel the husk off. Otherwise, you can't even see it. So as long as you have to peel the husk off, you don't have to worry about mixing it up with a poisonous lookalike. And then you know, I, have, I have found these wild in Essex County, and these do uh, taste like uh, sweet cherry tomatoes. They're really fun. Next slide. Okay, here's the evening primrose. This is the edible stage of the plant. Uh, uh, this is a biennial plant. It has a two-year life cycle. So the first year, it looks just like this. Hit the button. Okay, so, and then the second year produces a flower that looks like that. So, uh, and those plants get about this tall, but the rosette is just flat along the ground. So, the rosette, you just grab that entire foliage and yank on it. Next, click again, please. And that's what the root looks like. And you see how it's got a pink coloration near the top. It always has that. And the, so far, my favorite way to use these roots is to use them to make pancakes from them, like potato pancakes. You use whatever potato pancake recipe you have and substitute an equivalent amount of the evening primrose root. It should come out great. Next slide. Okay, here's burdock. Click again. Here's burdock. This is the plant that produces the brown burrs that get caught in your socks in the fall. And the guy who invented Velcro did get the idea from these burrs, by the way. So this is another biennial plant. Next slide. So this is what it looks like at the beginning of the second year. And so... Uh, like the evening primrose, the best time to get the root on both those plants is between the first and second growing seasons. That's when the maximum amount of food energy is going to be in the root. And so unfortunately, though, you can't just yank on the burdock foliage and get the root out. It will break on you. So you have to dig the roots out, which is a lot of work. And I pretty much don't bother. So instead, I harvest a different part of the plant. Next slide. Which is a developing flower stalk. And I just... Uh, next, click again, please. And so there you have uh, on the left... Uh, it was very quick to gather those central flower stalks on the second year plants. And then you just peel the outer layer of those, which is bitter and stringy, but then you have an elongated artichoke cart in the center. Chop those up and boil it in salted water till it's tender, which is about five minutes. And it's a delicious vegetable, just plain, or it's great thrown into spaghetti sauce. Or it's also good in the recipe. I'm sure a lot of you have made it, uh, have eaten it if you haven't made it yourself. Recipe where ordinarily you take artichoke hearts, Parmesan cheese, mayonnaise, breadcrumbs, and you mix it together together and you bake it in the oven and it's a spread that you put on crackers, you could substitute the boiled burdock flour stock rounds for the artichoke hearts and that recipe. It works great. Next slide. So that's what that is right there. And that recipe is on my webpage. So the handout I gave you today at the bottom of that handout is where to find me on the internet. And if you click on those links and just follow the various things, you'll, you'll find my recipe page on there. Next slide. Okay, here's cat briar, and uh, the edible part in this plant are the, the tender growth at the end of the woody stems in the spring into the early summer, and it has kind of a tart flavor, and you can just eat it raw on the spot or put it into salad, stuff like that. So this is Smilax rotundifolia, but there's a cousin of this plant I like even more, and it does grow in Ipswich. Next slide. And that's the carrion flower, Smilax herbacea or herbacea. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it. And this is a thornless, herbaceous, dies back to the ground every season, cousin of the cat briar. And so in the spring, you'll see in the left part of the slide there, it sends up these shoots that grow straight up, no thorns, and they, they look a lot like asparagus. And they feel like asparagus in your hands. And you harvest them just like asparagus. You just snap off the top part of the plant. And there's my wife, Ellen, and she's got a bunch of the carrion flower shoots there. So then you uh, boil them or steam them to their tender, just like asparagus, and uh, eat them like asparagus. And they taste like asparagus, and they're related to asparagus. So why is the plant called carrion flower? Next slide. So... Um, here we're cooking some up at a different occasion. I'm using a frisbee as a plate here. And you see those little spherical balls on the little stems there? Those are the flower buds. If I had waited a week later to harvest this plant, it would smell like dirty gym socks or rotting meat. And so that's why it's called carrion flower. So it's pretty repulsive when you counter the plant then. But if you harvest it before it blooms, it's delicious. Next slide. 
Okay, I'm going to talk about mushrooms later in the show because the main harvesting time for mushrooms in New England is between uh, 4th of July and Columbus Day. And we're still in the spring now. So, But there is one really fun mushroom to look for the spring, and that's the morel. And I have found morels in Ipswich, so it is possible. And um, not this particular species. This is the black morel, which I find not in the middle of wilderness somewhere, but usually right near people's houses, like in the pea gravel by the foundation, as in this case, or by the shrubbery by the front door, or by the walk, or in the mulch. Next slide. So all these mushrooms was from one person's house in Weston. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so it is possible to find so many in a really small area. Next slide. This is the variety I found in Ipswich. This is the yellow morel. And where I tend to find these is under old apple trees or recently dead elm trees where the bark hasn't sloughed off the tree yet, where the, the tree has died, but the bark is still attached. And the time to look for them is Mother's Day weekend. That's when I see them. And uh, so good luck. I hope you find some. I have found them in Essage under recently dead, uh, 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 under recently dead elm tree. Next slide. OK, black locust. This is another invasive species, another guilt-free foraging opportunity. And these flowers uh, smell just like jasmine. And you can stuff your face right by the tree. The flowers taste like sweet pea pods. Or you can make fritters from them. Next slide. So you just strip the flowers off the central stalks and you could, you know, eat them raw, put them into salad, stuff like that. Or, next slide, you make the fritters from them. And that recipe's in my book. Next slide. Pokeweed's edible. There's a whole chapter on pokeweed in my book, so I won't go into that. Next slide. Uh, that's just a close-up of the edible part on a pokeweed plant. Next slide. Uh, milkweed's got a chapter in my book. Um, that's one of the four edible stages of milkweed when the buds are in a nice tight green cluster. So the, there's recipe in my book for that. Next slide. So you have to boil both pokeweed shoots and milkweed for seven minutes to make them safe to eat. But in both cases, the part of the plant that you're cooking won't shrink or get all mushy on you even after all that boiling. You see how well the milkweed buds held up even these have been already cooked for, boiled for seven minutes, and they look great. So on the left there is milkweed egg puff, which is like a cross between a souffle and a casserole, and, uh, uh, and that uh, uh, uses the buds, and that's very good. Next slide. We say it's safe to eat. Yes, milkweed is safe to eat if you boil it for seven minutes. I can absolutely say for sure. For sure, for sure, for sure, it is safe to eat. Um, well, supposedly there's this cardiac glycoside in the plant that makes all the insects that eat it, uh, you know, makes them toxic to the things that are eating the insects. But I just know a lot of foragers that eat this plant a lot, and nobody's gotten sick as long as they cook it the way that I'm describing. Okay, so anyway, uh, the pods are edible when the pods are about an inch long and nice and firm to the touch, so not springy or spongy, and the flavor is almost indistinguishable from green beans. So same cooking method, boil for seven minutes. So uh, yes, monarch butterflies lay their eggs on the milkweed plants and the caterpillars eat the leaves, and so uh, it is important to bear that in mind when you're harvesting this plant. And uh, you might be one of these people who says, well, you know, I, I couldn't live with myself if I did anything that could possibly take any food away from a monarch ever, ever, ever. So, uh, but if you just harvest the young pods, they do not play any role in the butterfly's life cycle. So you could do that with a clear conscience. What I do is a kind of karmic payback to the plant is this time of year, as the pods begin to ripen and split open and the parachute seeds are showing, if I see a nice healthy patch of milkweed, I'll gather some of those seeds and take them with me. And if I see an old field that doesn't have any milkweed, I'll just release the seeds there and help establish a new population. Next slide. <coughs> okay, sassafras is edible. It has leaves with three different shapes, so it's very easy to recognize. Next slide. So the roots have that root beer flavor, and although the Food and Drug Administration says that saffron, which is the main flavor in, in agent in the sassafras roots is carcinogenic. Um, that was based in a study where they used a synthesized form of saffron and they fed it to rats. So all the study proved is that synthetic saffron, a huge amount of it is carcinogenic to rats. I'm not aware of anybody getting cancer from eating sassafras. But that said, if you say, well, I, I don't care, you know, if there's any possibility there could be anything to it, I'm not going to eat the root. That's totally fine. I totally support you in doing that. And I support you whatever, you know, decision that you make, well, I'm not sure this plant's growing in a clean area. I'm not sure I've accurately identified it. And you chicken out, it's very sensible to do that. So anyway, but um, 
I have made a candy from this, uh, the root bark uh, and the recipes in my book. Uh, it's like the root beer barrels you used to buy at the penny candy store, only even more intense because there's a little bit of root bark embedded in the candy. Next slide. So the young sassafras leaves are used to make filet powder. That's what filet powder is. And there's no saffron in the leaves. So you don't have to worry about the possible carcinogen uh, issue. And you just dry the leaves and, uh, and um, then put the powder into any kind of a shaker to just add to your food at the end to flavor and thicken it. Next slide. Lamb's quarters, I mentioned this before, it's a great salad ingredient. It is a wild spinach. It has more vitamins than spinach. You can eat it raw or steamed. You do not have to boil it. And that dust in the center of each plant that's not from the field or the road or anything that's a natural mealy dust, the plant produces itself. It's just a way to help identify the plant. Next slide. Cattails are edible. There's a whole chapter on cattails in my book, so I won't go into detail there. Uh, so on the right side, you see a swelling near the top of the plant. That's the immature flower head, and that's one of the edible parts on cattail. Next slide. So that's what they look like after you peel the outer leaves away, and these you just uh, steam or boil until they're tender, and they taste like a cross between artichokes and corn. Next slide. Then the cattail heart in the center of the plant is edible, and... Um, it tastes like uh, cucumber or hearts of palm. Next slide. And then there's a the cattail pollen, which is hypoallergenic. And you can collect that just by going into the cattail marsh with a plastic bag and bending the flower heads into the bag, giving it a little shake, and this big cloud of yellow pollen comes off. And you keep repeating that, and you get a cup or more of the, the pollen. Next slide. Then you put it through a fine mesh sieve just to hold back any twigs or bugs or whatever. And then you add the cattail pollen to flour to make these beautiful and very nutritious cattail pollen baked products. Next slide. Like these cattail pollen muffins. Next slide. Okay, what's this plant? Very good. Who got that? Good job. Excellent. Yes. Click, please. This is wild rice. And wild rice does grow in Massachusetts, although I'll be honest with you, I have never gathered and processed my own wild rice because this is a lot of work. You have to pick it. Big deal. I pick stuff all the time, but then you have to parch it and winnow it to process it. And I just haven't done that. I do know people that have done it here in New England, but I buy my rice from the Ojibwe Indians that still collect it in the traditional way where they're paddling the canoes out in the lakes in northern Minnesota and bending the ripe uh, plants over the boat and whacking it with a stick and the ripe grains fall into the boat. And then they parch and winnow it. But they're doing it at such a huge scale, it just makes a lot more sense. Next slide. Okay, here is the uh, little leaf linden, but all tilia species are edible the exact same way. So whether it's the introduced species like this one or the native basswood, tilia americana. And the two edible parts are the young leaves you can eat raw and the flowers you make a tea from. And the flower tastes, the tea you make from the flowers tastes good and it also has two medicinal values. It's soothing to your digestive system and to your mental state. So uh, it's good for both things. Next slide. Juneberry, this is what the plant looks like when it's blooming. And next slide. And that's what the fruit, ripe fruit looks like. It looks somewhat like blueberries, but it's purple when it's ripe. And the flavor doesn't taste anything like blueberries at all. It tastes like a cross between cherries and almonds. So it's a fun tree to just stuff your face right by the tree. Or you can make stuff from the Juneberries in my book. I've got a recipe for Juneberry muffins, which you can use the fresh berries, frozen berries, or dried berries. And it works uh, well, either way. This is also uh, a plant the Native Americans used extensively for pemmican, which is their Native American equivalent of power bars, where they pound together the dried fruit with the meat and the, some animal fats to hold it all together and some nuts. And they make these highly portable, high energy bars that they would take on them with, take with them on journeys so they wouldn't have to be hunting and gathering all the time. Next slide. Mulberries are ripe at the same time as June berries, and uh, they're also a fun plant uh, a fruit to stuff your face right by the tree. And uh, I also will use June berries and mulberries together. Next slide. So, because they're ripe at the same time and the flavors complement each other very well. So, Juneberry mulberry strudel is really good. Next slide. Okay, jewel weed is edible, and we talked about this earlier because you can. this plant has been clinically proven to cure poison ivy for some people, and you just take the entire plant, juice it up, and then put that juice on the place where you either have poison ivy or where you think you were exposed to poison ivy. And if you want that remedy available year-round, what you can do is gather up a bunch of the plants and bring them home and throw them in a pot of water, boil it up, and take that liquid and pour it into ice cube trays and freeze it, and you can just put an ice cube on your skin. And some people claim that jewel weed juice is good for all kinds of skin irritations, including athlete's foot. So there is an edible part to jewelweed. It is the ripe seed inside the seed pod. 
tricky part is when the seed pods are ripe, they explode. So one of the nicknames of this plant is touch me not because if you brush against the plant when the seed pods are ripe, they just detonate. They shoot all over the place. So what you want to do if you want to eat those seeds is sneak up on one of those seed pods and grab it and have it explode in your hand. Next slide. So when you open up your hand, so there's the uh, ripe seed pod. So when that explodes, it looks like this. And then here are the seeds. And if you eat the seeds, they taste just like walnuts, like store-bought walnuts. And then another cool thing you can do, you don't need to do this to eat them, but just to see is if you gently rub the outer seed covering off, the inner seed colors this beautiful, bright robin's egg blue color. And I've no idea why that color is in there. No creatures ever see it. It's just one of those unexplained mysteries of Mother Nature. Next slide. And if you're exceedingly patient, you can make stuff with the jewelweed seeds. Next slide. Okay, purslane's edible. This is a hot summer uh, garden weed is where you're likely to encounter it. And it's edible raw or cooked. It's high in iron and omega-3 fatty acids, so it's very good for you. And I'm going to show you a great way to use purslane that also requires no cooking skill whatsoever. Next slide is you can put the purslane leaves in gazpacho and you don't even have to make the gazpacho. You can go to the store and buy the gazpacho and then just go out to your yard and pick the purslane and throw it in there and the texture of the purslane works really well in a gazpacho. Next slide. Okay, black raspberry is edible. The fruits ripe in July, but this is the important part of the slide to look at right now because that's what the stems look like during their dormant time and that's actually a great skill to learn how to recognize black raspberries when they're dormant and remember where they are and go back and get them uh, at the right time in early July when the fruit is ripe because that purple color gets more and more pronounced as the grow growing season comes to a close and as the plants become dormant in the winter. So especially when you're out in the middle of the winter cross-country skiing, you can see that purple color from a great distance from hundreds of yards away and then learn a next you know spot to go pick black raspberries the following summer. Next slide. Okay, black cherries are edible. The flavor varies quite a lot. Sometimes they're puckery and astringent, not very good at all. And other times uh, they could be really sweet. Uh, one of the sweetest black cherries I ever had was uh, near the Babcock Reservoir in Gloucester. But I've also had other good ones in Essex County too, so it's not just that one. Uh, you know, so they can be very tasty, but they are small. There's no getting around that. Black cherries will approach, but not quite get to a half an inch in diameter. And the pits aren't that much smaller than conventional cherry pits. So I wouldn't recommend using black cherries for any recipe that require pitting each individual fruit because that would be exceedingly tiresome. So uh, I'll just throw the fruit, whatever I don't stuff my face from right by the uh, tree. I just uh, throw the fruit in a pot with some water and, and simmer it for a while to soften it up. That put everything through a sieve or a food mill and all the pits are held back and all the pulp goes through and then you have this juicy puree which you can use for making black cherry jam, jelly, uh, fruit soup, cordial, stuff like that. Now, um, this might be an interesting thing to point out. You notice how that leaf on the left has been chewed by something. I just got reminded earlier this week that black cherry hosts many, many different species of insects. Now, why is that important? Because birds feed their nestlings, their little baby birds, things like caterpillars and stuff. And so the more that our native species, which tend to support insects, are available to feed birds, the better the birds are. So black cherry is edible by us, and it's edible by a lot of bugs, which are edible by the birds. So two benefits. Next slide. Okay, here is elderberry, or at the flowering stage of elderberry, and um, this is uh, where I have to get on my soapbox a little bit because I've been, as I explained before, I've been teaching foraging for uh, four decades now, and for most of that time, this is a very esoteric subject that relatively few people were interested in, but I have to say over the last half dozen years or so, I've noticed a distinct uptick in interest in foraging, and uh, some of that is great. Um, you know, uh, some of it is driven by the do-it-yourself crowd, the people that want to, like, put in their own chicken coops and their own beehives and brew their own beer and um, make their own sauerkraut and stuff like that. And so they want to know how to forage, too. That's, that's fine. But I'm also hearing a little bit more interest on the uh, commercialization set, you know. So I get... I got an email, for example, from a fancy uh, produce store in Cambridge that wanted me to tell them where all the elderberry plants were so they could pick all the flowers and make the syrup that they could sell at their store. I would not tell them. Uh, I told them the kind of habitat to look for with these plants, but I didn't want to tell them a specific spot because I was afraid they'd just go hammer it. 
So I don't know if this actually happened, but I can imagine this is a plausible scenario that some chef really is excited about elderflower and wants to put it on the menu and he says to some you know, underling, go pick me 10 pounds of elderflower. And so this poor schnook is running around, running around trying to find this plant and finally finds one and looks at it and says, you know, if I pick every flower off this plant, I can fill this order. I don't have time to run around and find more elderberry plants. I got to get back to the restaurant. So there go all the flowers, which means no flowers left for the pollinators. No berries are going to form in that plant because all the you have to leave the flowers on the plant to get the berries so that's what I'm a word of uh, I'm worried about this uh, you know when these wild plants enter commerce I start to see some irresponsible behavior happening with them uh, because money is a very powerful motivating factor and people can start doing uh, things you know so I'm not worried about people picking for themselves you know if they're having a few friends over for dinner and stuff like that that scale you know foraging for the most part even with native species like this I think they can sustain it it's just when I just see you know uh, because the thing is that if that you know starts to sell at that one restaurant chefs these days they're very monkey see monkey do you know if one buddy's got it on the menu then somebody else I have to have that too so where'd you get it I've got to find it and all of a sudden you see this gold rush mentality going off into our native landscapes so I told this um, this uh, produce store, I said, you know, there's a lot of wonderful edible weeds and invasive species. You know, if you decide to commercialize those, it's much less likelihood there's going to be any adverse ecological impacts. And I could not get them to think about anything else other than this fixation they had on elderflowers. So I said, all right, then my advice to you is to get a farmer to grow it for you. Because a lot of farms have wonderful elderberry plant habitat is they'll be on the edge of a wetland where it's nice and sunny and that's exactly where elderberries like to grow in a nice wet meadowy habitat. And so uh, they grow very fast. A farm could put a whole bunch in and then if the restaurant turns to the farm, where they're probably buying stuff anyway, and they're also getting elderflower there, then they're not hammering the wild populations, and that, that would be okay. All right, so next slide. So this, these are a couple products made from the elderflower, and uh, so anyway, next, click again, please. All right, so remember I was telling you that some native species uh, rely on, uh, native animal species rely on plants for a portion of their life cycle. With this little critter right here, this is the elderberry borer beetle. This is the only place on earth this, plant, this organism lives. It's inside the stems of the elderberry plants. And it doesn't hurt the elderberry plants. They've co-evolved together, so they're fine. So... Um, so if, like, you know, all the chefs had to have elderflower and they're going picking all the elderflowers, they're not killing this beetle directly. But if we prevented the plants from reproducing and we began to lose the plant in the wild because of that, then this critter would be harmed. So I'm just talking to you. This is just one example of, you know, what potentially could happen if, you know, we uh, get a little crazy with monetization and commodification of wild foods. I'd rather, I'm much more comfortable just having people connect to the landscape directly with their taste buds. So I hope you understand that the purpose of this uh, program tonight is not to help you read a fancy restaurant menu better. I want to encourage you to go out and find this stuff and connect to the landscape through your taste buds directly, not through an intermediary like a restaurant or a produce store. All right, next slide. Okay, so if the elderflowers stay on the plants, then these elderberries form. This is around the end of August, and you can eat these berries after you dry them or cook them. They're not good to eat just raw. Uh, you can get a stomach ache from that. But once you dry them or cook them, you can eat them. And I like to mix them with apples, so like elderberry apple sauce, elderberry apple pie is a good way to use them. Next slide. Okay, Indian cucumber. Uh, this does grow in Essex County, although some other places in New England, particularly in the central part of New Hampshire, uh, where it's much more numerous, but we have it here. And this plant... Um, there's two conservation issues you have to be concerned about. One is that uh, this plant, because it isn't common, and because in order to get the edible part, which are the roots right here, you actually have to kill the individual plant. This is something I don't do lightly. I'm making sure I'm seeing dozens of plants before I ever think about pulling one up. And I have seen places in the woods in New England where there are hundreds of them, if not thousands of them. And then you could, you could definitely uh, gather uh, half a dozen, a dozen with a clear conscience. But anyway, so the roots taste like a jicama or a starchy cucumber, so they're really fun to eat. So if you do find a good-sized patch of them, yeah, it's okay to dig up a root. So anyway, but the other conservation issue is there is a federally protected orchid called the small world pagonia that bears a very strong resemblance to this plant. 
hit the slide, please. So there's the rare orchid. And um, so the, the uh, botanical name for the Indian cucumber I just showed you is Mediola virginiana. The botanical name for this plant is Isotria medioloides, which means looks like Indian cucumber. So how do you tell them apart? Well, you see the, the familiar thing is that whorl of leaves with the parallel veins in it. They both have that. But on the orchid, you just have a teeny little stem coming out of the center leaf, and that's where the orchid flower is. So can you go back a slide? If you look at the Indian cucumber plants, you see the larger plants have this double-decker thing going on where you have the whorl of leaves and then a second length of stem and then a second whorl of leaves where the flowers and the berries form. So if you're only harvesting the double-decker Indian cucumber plants, you'll never pick the rare orchid by mistake and the double-decker Indian cucumber plants have the bigger root anyway. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, spice bush. Uh, this is a fairly common plant in, here in southern New England. And uh, this is one of the plants that colonists turned to to make tea from during the Revolutionary War era when they were boycotting the British tea. They would just steep the twigs in hot water. And uh, I like to gather the berries and dry them and then use them as a black pepper or a Szechuan peppercorn substitute. Um, but these berries are have, they're high in lipids and they're important food for migrating songbirds. So I make sure to leave plenty of... Uh, fruits on the plant. Next slide. And there's another reason why spice bushes are cool. So if you're thinking about diversifying your landscaping at home and you have a uh, damp, uh, shaded by hardwoods uh, spot in your yard and you're wondering what would work there, spice bush would be an excellent choice. Not only because it's edible, but because it supports the spice bush swallowtail caterpillar, which is a really cool critter. Next slide. Okay, wintergreen is edible, and uh, you can make a tea from the leaves, and the little berries are edible. They're not that sweet, but you can eat them. Next slide. And black birch also has the oil of wintergreen in it, uh, as does yellow birch. It's just a botanical coincidence. The plants aren't related. So you can make a tea from the birch twigs, and this is very easy. You can do this year-round. Next slide. So you just peel the twigs and put the peeled twigs and the peelings in a mason jar and just fill it up with water and let it sit around for a few hours. That's all you have to do if you put enough twigs and peelings in there and uh, just pour the water off and you get this wonderful uh, wintergreen flavored tea. And you can tap any birch tree for sap, like a maple tree, and if you boil it down, you eventually get something that looks like this. It's like a molasses. Uh, but birch sap is even waterier than maple sap, so you have to boil the heck out of it to get this. So my advice is just go buy molasses. You're not going to save any time uh, making your own from birch sap. Next slide. Okay, what's this plant? Nope. Time's up. Hit the button. Beach plum. I thought maybe you folks would get this since uh, you have it. Uh, anyway, beach plums, this, this, you probably all know this secret, but if you don't, this might be the most valuable piece of information I give you the entire show. The best time to spot a beach plum is when the plants are blooming in the spring. And this is usually mid to late May when they're like this, and they have these masses of creamy, yellowish white flowers on the plants. And, um, and then you can see them at quite a distance because, next slide, when the fruit is ripe, it's this purple color, and purple is a very hard color to see at a dis distance. And also, beach plums, usually the fruit is underneath the leaves, and so you have to be practically standing right next to the bush to see the fruit. And so, uh, so my advice is pick your spots in May, learn where the plants are, and then go check those plants uh, last week of August through at least the first half of September uh, for the beach plums. Next slide. And although this doesn't matter to you because you're along the coast here, beach plums also will grow further inland too uh, if the conditions are right. Next slide. Okay, beach peas are edible. Um, the flavor isn't quite as good as garden peas, but if you're at the beach anyway, uh, I think it's funner to be picking beach peas than just sitting around in a towel getting skin cancer. So next slide. Uh, so there's my wife, Ellen. Just What's that? Uh, actually, uh, beach, beach peas can come out in a, sort of a, a mid-spring time, and then they seem to uh, wilt a little bit in the hot, hot time in the midsummer. But then, in, as the cooler September weather comes, they'll produce another crop of flowers and, and, uh, and beach peas. Okay, next slide. Okay, this is sea rocket. This is a uh, in the same botanical family that uh, the wasabi paste is made from, and it has a very similar flavor to wasabi. So um, I'm just picking a couple leaves per plant off when I'm using this plant just to make sure I'm not going to hurt the plant because it's not that common. Next slide. 
this is ORAC. This is a cousin of the Lamb's Quarters that uh, is, it's okay raw, but it's really good cooked. Uh, and so uh, um, this is worth checking out. Next slide. Uh, glass wort, um, which you can eat raw or you can uh, cook it like little beans. Um, once again, I'm just picking the tender tips off the plant. I'm not digging these plants up. I'm leaving them be just to make sure that they uh, 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 can thrive in that location again. Next slide. Uh, a lot of seaweeds are edible. This is a good one, dulse, which when you dry it, it remains soft and flexible and it's very uh, briny. Next slide. So up in uh, Grand Manan Island in, Nova, in uh, New Brunswick, they'll serve it like uh, uh, chips, you know, on the table instead of, you know, chips and salsa in a Mexican restaurant. Next slide. Okay, and then there's Irish moss, which uh, is the source for carrageen. So Irish moss is used to make puddings like this blancmange over here. Next slide. And this is an invasive seaweed called codium. So this is called uh, green fleece or dead man's fingers. And, uh, and this, uh, I believe this comes from Asia and it might have come over in ship ballast, whatever. Well, it, it has uh, uh, um, established itself in the Gulf of Maine, so this area of the ocean, and also even more down around Cape Cod Bay into uh, Vineyard Sound and further down into Long Island and stuff like that. Uh, the ecologists really hate this plant. Uh, it is edible, and I'm doing a um, foraging program on the vineyard this Sunday, and I'm going to talk this plant up. I hope the chefs do get excited about this plant. I hope they all put it on the menus. In fact, I'm trying to encourage them to have some kind of a codium cook-off or a challenge and have them do different recipes and try to, because this is one of those cases where the more they picked it, the better off the environment would be uh, to get less of this out there. Next slide. Okay, roses are edible, uh, rose flowers are edible, and the rose fruits are edible, and this is any species of rose, wild or domesticated. Next slide. So there's uh, this you're all familiar with. This is the uh, Rosa rugosa, which is nice to gather just because it's big, and so uh, there's a lot less labor involved in gathering them, and you still should be able to find some rose hips like that out there. And a, a fresh rose hip tastes like a cross between an orange and apple and strawberry. It's really yummy, and... Um, uh, next slide. Okay, so let's get to uh, the mushrooms. So we're in, uh, you know, sort of the summer into the fall period in the show. So this is uh, the sulfur shelf mushroom. And before I get into this one, let me just say that the risk of picking and eating the wrong kind of mushroom and getting very sick and possibly even dying is significant. There's no getting around that. We do have some mushroom species that have toxins in them. And there's about a half a dozen species that are potentially lethal. And unfortunately, there's nothing from the flavor that gives you any indication that there's anything to worry about. So you could have this delicious mushroom meal one day and be dead several days later from liver or kidney failure. All right. So that's the bad news. The good news is that you can arrange all the mushroom species there are on a line and cluster at one end of those species that are virtually impossible to confuse with anything poisonous. Those at the other end that even the experts can't tell apart. And as long as you stay at the safe end of the line and you gradually work your way out as you gain experience and confidence. That's how you stay out of trouble. All right, everybody get that? Okay, good. So this mushroom is way at the safe end of the line. This is called the sulfur shelf mushroom or the chicken mushroom because when you pull the meat apart on the mushroom, it looks like the breast meat of a chicken. And what you want to look for is a bright pumpkin orange coloration on the top, bright sulfur yellow on the underside, and it's growing in layers like shelves on wood, so either on a log or a tree or a stump. And, uh, and you'll notice on the underside of uh, each little uh, um, growth here that there's no gills, all right? This, just, this is a polypore mushroom, so the spores are just falling out of little holes in the underside, all right? So if you remember all those things, uh, this is way at the safe end of the line, and the only look-alike to this mushroom is another edible mushroom. Next slide. So this is the pink, uh, uh, the Cincinnatus form, which tends to be uh, pinker and whiter than the... Uh, you know, the, the orange and yellow version, but this is also equally edible. Next slide. So the only, uh, so the French uh, name for this mushroom is trompettes de mort, which means trumpets of death. Uh, but that's just because it's black. Can you hit the button? So this is actually the black trumpet chanterelle, and this is a safe mushroom, delicious with no poisonous lookalikes. The tricky part about this mushroom is finding the first one because they're black and they're only about two and a half to three inches tall and they're hard to see. Uh, but once you spot one, just stop in your tracks and look around, and you're most likely going to find more, sometimes dozens more, sometimes hundreds more. And um, 
So these are nice to use. You can use them fresh, or actually this mushroom dries very well. Another good way to use it. Next slide. Uh, I'm usually finding in hardwood woods, often where there are beech trees, often where there's a depression in the ground, like a vernal pool or some seep, where there's a little bit of runoff collecting in an area for a while. Okay, so this is a member of the tooth uh, fungus group. There are no poisonous tooth mushrooms. There are some that don't taste good, but nothing that uh, would require a trip to the emergency room or anything. So if you look on the underside of the cap here, you can see there are teeth hanging down like the roof of a cave. And so uh, that's what to look for. And this is the, the sweet tooth of the hedgehog mushroom, and I often see this one under hemlocks. And, uh, and it could still be out now. Next slide. Okay, the only look-alike to the mushroom in the center of that photo is a volleyball. That is a giant puffball mushroom, and uh, those are edible as long as they're nice and firm and white inside. You don't want them to be yellow or green or any other color. And the standard way to cook those is just slice it into half-inch thick steaks, roll it into a beaten egg, and then is some seasoned cracker crumbs or bread crumbs, and fry it in a skillet and some butter, and make country-fried puffball steaks. And that one mushroom can easily feed everybody in that photo. Next slide. Okay. They're more common uh, further west than here where the soil's a little bit less acidic, like uh, in New York State where there's more limestone soil, but I do occasionally see them in Massachusetts. Yes? And the smaller ones are edible too? Yeah, uh, uh, some puffballs are edible. There are a couple poisonous small puffballs, like there's a poison pigskin puffball, which when it's very, very small, it can be white inside too. When they get mature, they turn a dark black in color, and then you would know it's not safe to eat. But the giant puffball, as I say, has no lookalikes other than a volleyball. Next slide. Okay, so this photo was taken the morning of my wedding. I got married in Ipswich at Steep Hill Beach, and uh, we got... Uh, 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 Priscilla Brooks to allow us to stay in her house on Argilla Road that weekend. And uh, this is before TTOR got all the fancy digs out at the, that they have there now. So we needed to find a place to stay. And just in her yard, just in the morning when the paper came, there was a porcini mushroom just right by the paper. So it was a very auspicious beginning to uh, that day. And so this is called the, the Sepp in France, the Steinpils in Germany. Uh, this is one of the most highly sought after species of mushrooms in the world. And we have it here in Ipswich and in uh, Massachusetts. So next slide. So what you want to look for is the top of the cap is the same color as a loaf of baked bread. And then on the under layer is a spongy layer, which is a characteristic that boletes. This is a member of the bolete uh, group of mushrooms have. And if you look at the mature specimens, that color up there, you see that it's olive yellow in color, the spongy layer when the mushrooms are mature. Can you go back a slide? And on the younger uh, Boletus edulis, it's white. But the main thing to look for in a Boletus edulis is near the top of the stalk, you see uh, it almost looks like somebody wrapped a very fine mesh or gauze around the top of the stalk. That's called a reticulation. And on the Boletus edulis, it's white. So the, the uh, non-edible but non-poisonous lookalike that people often mix this mushroom up with is called the bitter bolete. And on the bitter bolete, the reticulation is a brown and the, the spongy layer is a pinky color. So, uh, but the bitter bolete isn't poisonous, it's just uh, tastes bitter. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, here's a beefsteak mushroom and all I did was cut it in half and stick the lower half down here. This looks like a piece of meat hanging on a tree. And, um, and uh, you see when you cut it in half, it's got marbling just like a piece of meat. And when you squeeze it, red juice comes out like a piece of meat. So my favorite way to cook this mushroom is just brush it with a little teriyaki sauce and grill it on a hibachi, just like a piece of meat. Next slide. Okay, this is the cauliflower mushroom. This is one of my favorites, and it looks like a big mass of egg noodles at the base of a pine tree, usually in September. And I have seen them in Ipswich, so... Um, Anyway, so that photo was taken a long time ago before my wife and I got married. Next slide. And this is a more recent photo. Same species of mushroom there. So you see it looks like a big mass of egg noodles. And when you cook it up, it tastes like mushroomy egg noodles. It's really fun. Next slide. Okay, here's a bear's head tooth. These grow on beech trees usually, and uh, they look like a little frozen waterfall hanging on a tree. And the texture of these is very similar to crab meat. Next slide. 
Okay, here's probably the most bizarre organism in the show. This is corn smut, and it's a fungus that gets in the developing ears of corn, and it distends the little uh, kernels. Next slide, you get a close-up of it. So it's a pretty disgusting-looking uh, thing, I have to admit. But anyway, uh, go, can you go back? Go back a slide. Okay, so, but I've got a big grin on my face because I had heard that in Mexico, this is a delicacy, in fact, during the days of the Aztecs, I heard that if a peasant found the corn smut growing on his corn, he wasn't even allowed to touch it. He'd have to send for the emissaries of the emperor, and they would collect it and take it off to the royal courts, and only the royalty could eat it. And I thought, all right, it must be good then. So I cooked it like you cook a standard store-bought mushroom, and it tasted like mud. And I thought, what is the big deal about this stuff? So then I tried it one more time, and I cooked it. Mexican style with some poblano chiles and there's some kind of chemical transformation that happens with the capsaicin and the hot peppers that makes the corn smut tasty. So that was the secret. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, so here's hen of the woods mushrooms. These grow at the base of oak trees usually, uh, red or black oak usually, and the bigger and older the oak tree is, the more likely you are to find these. And I have found like a half a dozen of these around one tree. So uh, they can be quite prolific. And it's, these are normal sized ones where they're about a foot in diameter. They can get more than twice that large. But uh, anyway, next slide. So uh, we had some help finding all these mushrooms here, but that, that's not unusual to find so many under good conditions. It has not been good conditions this year. They've been much more sporadic than normal. Too dry. Next slide. Uh, but my favorite stage to get the head of the woods is at the chick stage when they're just coming out and then uh, they're nice and tender all the way through. Next slide. Okay, so let's get back to plants. This is the staghorn sumac. Uh, so these are right outside the building here, just on the other side of the practice football field. And um, any sumac with red berries is not poison sumac. Poison sumac has drooping clusters of greenish white berries. So there's nothing to fear on the red berried sumacs. In fact, you can make a drink from these berries. So you pick them off the plant. Next slide. And then uh, you just put these in a bucket of water and pull the berry clusters apart in the water for a few minutes. You're getting the flavoring off the berries into the liquid. Then strain it and then sweeten it if you want. And uh, then next slide. And then you have the sumac aid, which uh, uh, is very tasty. Next slide. All right, wild grapes. Uh, this is the uh, uh, fox grape, which uh, produces the large grapes that you often smell before you see them. And then you follow your nose to the vine and stuff your face by the vine. And uh, they can make grape juice, grape sorbet, grape chiffon pie, or, next slide. Uh, oh, so that's a very familiar scene, you know, in my car, basket like that in early September. Next slide. Or you can make grape cheesecake from the uh, uh, wild grapes. Next slide. Okay, then this species also grows in Ipswich. This is the riverside grape, uh, where the grapes aren't that yummy, but the leaves are very tender and delicate, and a lot of people that make the stuffed grape leaf recipes prefer to use these instead of the, uh, the fox grape leaves. But you can use any variety of wild grape for stuffing. Next slide. So there's the stuffed grape leaves. Next slide. Okay, what's this slide of? Oh, good, you got this one. Very good, yes. This is cranberries. Cranberries used to be called crane berries because the flowers look like little cranes. So next, click again, please. Okay, yes, this is a cranberry. Next slide. And if I showed you this photo, you would have known what I was talking about. So I'm, I, I realize that I'm disagreeing with some of you here, but some people say, oh, you haven't lived until you try the flavor of a wild cranberry. I think it's the same flavor as a cultivated cranberry. It's fun to gather your own wild cranberries, and, and uh, there, are, there are places to do that in Ipswich, so it's a fun thing to do. Next slide. Okay, so hazelnuts, we have two different kinds, the beaked hazelnut and the common hazelnut. And the nut looks like this once you get the husk off. So this is the common one. Next slide. So there's the beaked hazelnut where the nut's in there and you have this strange thing sticking out like a bird's beak. And um, same thing with hazelnuts. The flavor of the wild hazelnuts is the same as the cultivated hazelnuts. So you might say, well, why bother to pick them? They're smaller and, you know, I could just go to the store and buy them. So go to the store and buy them. But uh, for me, I have gathered thousands of hazelnuts um, and they are available uh, here in Essex County. Next slide. Okay, so it has been a very good year for the white oak acorns. Uh, I haven't gathered any myself because I'm preoccupied picking other things right now, but I have seen a lot of them. And what you want to do is look for the acorns that are on the trees with the rounded lobes. 
on the leaves because those acorns have less tannic acid in them, so they require less processing. You can eat any acorn if you process it long enough, but the white oak acorns require less of it. Or it's also swamp white oak, post oak, chestnut oak, and burr oak are all rounded lobe species. Next slide. And uh, yes, what you can make from the acorn flower that once you process the acorns. Next slide. Okay, so uh, shagbark hickory is my number one favorite out of the more than 150 species of edible wild plant. And shagbark hickories are in season now, so I'm very happy. And uh, it's a reasonably good year for them, especially here in Ipswich. A lot of trees are producing. It's, I came up here early so I could pick some of your hickory nuts. And uh, so I'm, uh, thank you for uh, being able to do that. And uh, so there's the bark on the left side of the photo. So that's not a seasonal phenomenon. That bark always looks like that. So I am always paying attention to the landscape as I'm driving around. If I see a bunch of shagbark hickory trees, I'll pull over and get my road atlas out and mark it where those trees are. Uh, so there's what the nuts look like when they come off the tree. There's what they look like when you get the outer part off. There's the penny for scale. Next slide. So yeah, very typical scene. You know, my car this time of year, basket filled with hickory nuts like that, like the basket on the table over there. There's the penny for scale, what the nuts look like inside. And I have some nuts over there for you to try. And I actually have some fresh hickory nuts that I brought, which are uh, very viable and will sprout into trees. So I encourage you to take all the nuts I brought tonight, because I've got so many more in my car. Any place where you want a hickory nut tree to grow, just put them in the ground about an inch, an inch and a half down, just like a squirrel would. And if you want to make sure the squirrels don't dig them up, then you have to take a piece of hardware cloth, the wire mesh, and put it on top and stake it down a little bit and allow the tree to sprout next year. And once the tree is about eight or nine inches tall, then it's safe to uh, uh, remove the hardware cloth. So, uh, yeah, so it will be 20 years, though, from the time you plant that nut to when the tree gets big enough to actually produce nuts. And you might say, well, that's a long time. And I agree it is a long time, but... Um, you know, it's how there are going to be hickory trees if the squirrels and we help them along by planting more hickory trees. You do have a lot of hickory trees in Ipswich, so this area isn't really bereft of them. But uh, I also give nuts away like this at all my foraging programs. So I did one in Connecticut yesterday where I met this woman from Rhode Island who runs this Rhode Island native plant nursery, and she was thrilled to take a whole bunch of hickory nuts I gave her, and she's going to plant them in Rhode Island, and they need the hickory nuts down there. So anyway, so... Okay, next slide. So this recipe is in my book. This is one of the fun ways to use hickory nuts. This is the New England version of pecan pie. Uh, and most of the people I feed this to, they prefer it over pecan pie. It's really good. And that recipe, as I said, is in my book. Yes, ma'am. I, I just remember picking those when I was a kid. And I think my mother had us go shell them to get us out of her hair. Yes. It, there's not a lot of nut in there. I'm going to show you a secret of how to get them open. Uh, where you get big pieces out. Because you'll see in the little jar over there where I have some samples for hickory nuts for you to try, there are big pieces. So it's actually, there is a way to reduce the amount of nut picking you have to do. Okay? And actually, um, hickory nuts vary in size from tree to tree. Sometimes they're relatively small, but sometimes you'll see some of the ones I have in that basket over there are quite large. And so there actually is quite a bit of nut in that, inside that shell. Okay, next slide. All right, so here are several of the cookies that I make from shagbark hickory nuts, and I did bring a couple of these for you to try tonight. So we'll do that at the end. Next slide. Okay, right. So there's the Barbary, and this is not, by the way, the Japanese Barbary, which is really despised by ecologists. That's the berries on Bergii. And the berries on Japanese Barbary are born singly in the underside of the stalk. And if you look at this common Barbary, which grows in Ipswich, you'll see that the flowers, click please, and the berries grow in clusters of like a dozen per cluster. So this is the European or the common Barbary and not the Japanese Barbary, which bears the berry singly in the underside of the stalk. So I had a woman in one of my walks a few years back, and she said the way that she remembers the difference is that Japan is just one country and Europe is many countries. So this is the many country Barbary. So I make a jelly from this, which you saw on that previous slide, and it's really good in those thumbprint cookies with the hickory nuts on the outside. Next slide. 
Okay, black walnuts. So I do have some samples of black walnuts for you to taste and for you to look at over there. These are just coming into season now. These grow in Ipswich. So you often see these piled along the side of the road. And usually when I see that, I go knock on the door of the homeowner and I say, I see you have some black walnuts. Is it okay if I pick some? And the typical response I get is, wait a minute, let me get my wheelbarrow and fill it up for you. As people are eager to get this messy thing off their property because, next slide. Because when these start falling, these, this outer part here starts to smell and it starts to rot and it's kind of messy and so a lot of people would just rather, you know, clear their land of it. So I'm happy to take it off their hands. And so you have to get that part out and I gave you a handout which tells you how to do that. So after you get the green part off, then next slide. Then you have, that's what it looks like after you clean that all off. And then you crack these open to get the nut meat. Next slide. And then here's two different things which I make from uh, black walnut. So I gave you a recipe for the baklava on the right side, on the left side. And then I did bring some of this on the right side. So you can try that too. Next slide. Okay, here's ground nut. And ground nut, the actual main edible part in this plant isn't a nut. It's actually a tuber. Next slide. So there's the tubers. So these are underneath the ground a couple inches down. And, um, and so far, my favorite way to cook these is just to slice them thinly and fry them in a little, little vegetable and make groundnut chips. So go to the next slide. So that's what's going on here. Next slide. Okay, Jerusalem artichoke. This grows in Ipswich, and uh, this produces an edible tuber uh, that's in season now. By this time of year, you should be able to get them because the plants have pretty much finished blooming and they're sending the energy down below the ground to produce the tubers. Next slide. So that's what the tubers look like. They can come uh, on a mauve colored part on the outside or this beige color. There's the golf ball for scale, but they're edible either way. And you can use them most ways to use potatoes. You can bake them, boil them, mash them, fry them, and so on. Next slide. So there's the autumn olive. So this is what it looks like when it's blooming in mid to late May. It has a nice sweet smell. It's very, very similar to sweet pepper bush. So if you know that plant, uh, which blooms in the summer a different time, this blooms in the spring, but the smell I think uh, is quite, quite similar. So, uh, so that's what it looks like in the spring. Next slide. There's a close up of the flowers. Next slide. And that's what the fruit looks like. So uh, this is what you should see along the roadsides, especially anywhere along Route 95 from Newburyport all the way down to basically 128. In fact, one place where you can see a ton of this plant, although there's not a lot of fruit on the plants this year, is the big intersection of Route 1 and 95 where the Ferncroft Hotel exit is. That entire intersection is autumn olive that the Mass Highway Department planted. So not a great place to actually try to collect it. <laughs> uh, you know, you could get yourself killed out there. But anyway, but just uh, if you head off in any direction from there and just check the edges of fields and gravel pits and stuff like that, you'll find it. And uh, so, so this plant grows in great quantities, produces great quantities of fruit. So I just use these little uh, uh, milking motions or just stroking motions to get hundreds of fruit falling into my basket. And I bring it home and I throw it into a big pot like a lobster pot with just enough water to keep the fruit from scorching like a half an inch in the bottom. Simmer it for a while, put everything through a food mill or a sieve to hold back all the seeds and all the pulp goes through. And then uh, I pour that into trays in a food dehydrator and I let it run overnight. Next slide. Oh, that's a close-up of the berries. Next slide. And then there's the fruit leather on the left side. That's what I get. So there is nothing added to that. No sugar, no lemon juice. That's just 100% autumn olive fruit pulp. So, and besides tasting good, it also has vitamin C in it. And the USDA did a study of the autumn olive fruit pulp a few years back. And they discovered that it's up to 18 times higher, higher in lycopene content than tomatoes. So anyway, and you can make uh, wine from autumn olives. So this is, uh, uh, gosh, I'm forgetting his, uh, Dick Edelman, uh, who runs the, uh, the um, uh, winery that's uh, Alfalfa Farm Winery. It's right along Route 95. And um, he uh, and I got talking one day, and, uh, and he found out what I, what I did. And, and um, he said, he said, well, you know about all this wild fruit. You must have been, you know, making wine from it. And I said, well, I'm not much of a drinker myself, but, I, but there is one particular species, the autumn olive, that when I teach this plant down in the Buzzards Bay area, I've been told that the Portuguese down there in the New Bedford area make wine from it. And he said, well, pick some from me and I'll, for me and I'll try it. So I picked him a couple baskets worth of autumn olive fruit and I gave it to him and he said, I'll see you next year because that's how long it takes to make wine. And then, uh, you know, I don't know, like nine, ten months later, I get a call. Your wine's ready. So he had made me a case of wine from this fruit, and it was really good. Next slide. 
Okay, so here's the last slide in the show. This photo documents a really successful foraging day I had uh, in the Worcester area about 10 years ago. So uh, let me tell you what's in this photo. So start off picking some wild pears, and there's some shagbar kickery nuts over in the left side there. You see a big basket full of the autumn olive fruit, and then there's a bunch of porcini mushrooms there, and that big mushroom with the dark chocolate-colored gills that's called Nagaricus arvensis, or horse mushroom, and those are very good. It's a wild cousin of the standard store-bought mushroom. So you're probably wondering what the barbecue grill is doing in the photo. Well, someone had put one of those out with their trash, and so I just forced